The 10 most embarrassing things actors desperately want you to forget ASAP and the stories behind them. Number 10. Quentin Tarantino, The Choke. In the early 2000s, the movie Kill Bill was Tarantino's passion project, a bloody and stylized homage to martial arts cinema. The film's star, Uma Thurman, was more than just an actress to Tarantino. She was his muse. Their collaboration was the stuff of legend, but it was also fraught with tension. Thurman trusted Tarantino implicitly, but that trust would be tested in ways she could never have imagined. One day on set, as they prepared to film a particularly intense scene, Tarantino insisted on taking control. It was a scene where Thurman's character, the bride, would be choked by a sadistic assassin. Tarantino wanted the scene to be as realistic as possible, and he believed that the only way to achieve this was to perform the act himself. He wrapped his hands around Thurman's neck, his eyes filled with a mixture of artistic fervor and something more primal. As the cameras rolled, Tarantino tightened his grip. Thurman's breath became shallow, her eyes wide with fear, but she did not break character. She trusted that Tarantino knew what he was doing, that he would stop before things went too far. But as the seconds ticked by, the line between acting and reality blurred. The fear in her eyes was no longer just for the camera, it was real. When the scene finally ended, Tarantino released his grip and Thurman collapsed, gasping for breath. The crew was silent, the atmosphere on set heavy with an unspoken unease. Thurman tried to shake it off, to convince herself that it was all in the name of art. But the experience left a mark on her that she would carry long after the film was completed. If that wasn't enough, the next part of the scene involved spitting. Another deeply personal and invasive act. Tarantino, committed to getting the shot exactly right, insisted on doing it himself. He explained to Thurman that he needed to ensure the spit landed perfectly, capturing the dehumanizing moment in all its brutal detail. As the cameras rolled again, Tarantino spat on Thurman. The act, though meant for the sake of the scene, felt humiliating and degrading. Thurman once more found herself grappling with the emotional and physical discomfort of the moment. Years later, on the set of Inglorious Bastards, a similar choking scene unfolded. This time, the actress was Diane Kruger, and the film was a brutal reimagining of World War II. Kruger played Bridget von Hammersmark, a German actress and spy who meets a grisly end at the hands of Christoph Waltz's character, Colonel Hans Landa. In one scene, von Hammersmark is choked until he is promoted to glory, and once again, Tarantino insisted on doing it himself, and when the scene was finally over, Kruger was left shaken, her trust in Tarantino severely tested. Number 9. Steven Tyler, The Underage Girl In the heart of the 1970s, rock and roll was more than just a genre of music. It was a lifestyle, one marked by excess, rebellion, and a disregard for the rules that governed everyday life. Steven Tyler, the flamboyant frontman of Aerosmith, was at the pinnacle of his career during this time. But beneath the surface of his rock star persona lay a troubling story, one that involved a young girl named Julia Holcomb. Julia Holcomb was just 16 years old when she first met Steven Tyler, just like the case of Paul Walker coming up in the video. Like many teenagers at the time, she was captivated by the allure of rock music and the larger-than-life personalities of its stars. Tyler, with his wild hair, raspy voice, and magnetic presence was at the height of his fame, and for Julia, meeting him was like stepping into a dream. It was at one of Aerosmith's concerts that their paths first crossed. Julia had managed to get backstage, where she encountered the man she had idolized from afar. Tyler was immediately drawn to her, and what began as a brief encounter quickly evolved into something far more serious. As their relationship progressed, Tyler convinced Julia's mother to sign over legal guardians guardianship to him. It was a shocking move, but in the permissive culture of the 1970s, it was allowed to happen without much scrutiny. This legal maneuver gave Tyler control over Julia's life, allowing him to take her on tour and live with her as if she were his partner, despite the fact that she was still a minor. Julia, just a teenager, traveled with Tyler, lived in his Boston apartment, and was exposed to the chaotic lifestyle of a rock star. The relationship was far from the fantasy she might have imagined. Instead, it was marked by a profound imbalance of power. 
Tyler was not only her lover, but also her legal guardian, a situation that left Julia vulnerable and dependent on him in ways she could not fully understand at the time. As their relationship continued, Julia became pregnant. She was just 17, and the reality of her situation began to weigh heavily on her. The excitement of being involved with a rock star faded as the enormity of her circumstances became clear. Tyler, who was dealing with the pressures of his career and the realities of impending fatherhood, was not ready to take on the responsibility of a child. Tyler suggested termination, believing it was the best course of action for both of them. Julia, still a teenager and heavily influenced by Tyler, reluctantly agreed. The decision was made under immense pressure, and the experience left her traumatized. The experience and the emotional fallout that followed began to unravel the relationship between Tyler and Julia. The trust that had once existed between them was shattered, and the chaotic lifestyle they had been living became too much for Julia to bear. Eventually, she made the difficult decision to leave Tyler and return to her family. Years later, Stephen Tyler, in his memoir, acknowledged the problematic nature of their relationship and expressed regret for the way things had unfolded. He admitted that the permissive culture of the time had played a role in his actions, but he also recognized the harm that had been done. Number 8. Chris Brown, The Rihanna Rough-Up up in the glamorous yet often tumultuous world of pop music, few stories have captivated and shocked fans as much as the relationship between Chris Brown and Rihanna. In the mid-2000s, Chris Brown emerged as a teenage sensation. His smooth voice and impressive dance moves quickly won him a dedicated fan base, and he became known as one of the most promising young stars in the industry. Rihanna, too, was on the rise with her unique style. The two artists seemed destined to be together. Their chemistry was palpable, and their public appearances fueled speculation about a budding romance. As their relationship blossomed, they became one of music's most beloved couples. They attended red carpet events together, shared affectionate posts on social media, and collaborated on chart-topping hits. However, beneath the surface of their seemingly perfect romance lay deep-seated issues that would soon erupt into violence. On the night of February 7, 2009, everything changed. As Chris and Rihanna Rihanna left a pre-Grammy party in Los Angeles, a heated argument erupted in the car. The details of that night are still haunting. Reports later revealed that Brown became physically aggressive with Rihanna, ultimately assaulting her. The attack left Rihanna with visible injuries, including bruises and cuts. The aftermath of the incident was swift and brutal. When images of Rihanna's injuries surfaced, public outrage erupted. Fans and fellow artists condemned Brown's actions, and the media quickly seized on the story, framing it as a cautionary tale of love gone wrong. In the wake of the incident, Rihanna canceled her scheduled performances, and Brown faced serious legal consequences. Chris Brown was arrested and charged with felony assault and making criminal threats. He ultimately accepted a plea deal, which included probation, community service, and domestic violence counseling. The fallout from the incident significantly damaged his career. Once hailed as a rising star, Brown faced a tidal wave of criticism, boycotts, and lost endorsements. Although they did rekindle their love afterwards, the hate and grudge people held against Chris continues to this day. Number 7. Amber Heard, The Turd the fallout between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard revealed so many skeletons in Amber's closet that it was ridiculous. One of the most bizarre and scandalous events during their tumultuous relationship was the infamous Poo-gate incident. Following a particularly heated argument, Depp returned home to find human feces on their bed. This strange act was interpreted as a final act of defiance from Heard. The incident became a source of public fascination and mockery, further tarnishing her reputation. Additionally, in the midst of their legal battles, audio recordings of conversations between Depp and Heard were leaked to the media. These recordings revealed intimate and troubling exchanges, including moments where Heard appeared to admit to physical altercations and dismiss Depp's claims of being a victim. Furthermore, Depp described instances where he felt controlled and emotionally tormented by Heard. She often used their love against him, creating a toxic environment that left him feeling isolated and vulnerable. 
unbelievable. This emotional manipulation was the beginning of a series of troubling behaviors that would define their tumultuous marriage. She also frequently belittled him, using derogatory language that undermined his confidence and self-worth. She was also physical with Depp, claiming that she once threw two vodka bottles at him, and when one exploded, it sliced his finger severely. In addition, Depp claimed Heard roundhouse punched him, which resulted in a bruise and once kicked a bathroom door to his head. Number 6. Tim Allen, The Coke Tim Allen's journey to stardom was anything but conventional. Before he became the face of home improvement, Allen faced numerous challenges. He grew up in a middle-class family in Denver, Colorado, but his teenage years were turbulent. After his father passed away when he was just 11 years old, Allen struggled with his emotions and eventually turned to substance abuse as a coping mechanism. By the time he reached adulthood, he had found himself entrenched in a world of drugs and crime. In 1978, before his fame, Allen was arrested at the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport for possession of over 650 grams of cocaine. At the time, he was facing significant legal troubles, and the drug trade was an all-too-familiar world for him. To avoid a lengthy prison sentence, Allen cooperated with the authorities, providing the names of other drug dealers in exchange for a reduced sentence. This decision led to his release after serving two years and four months at the Federal Correctional Institution in Sandstone, Minnesota. Number 5. Paul Walker and the Teen Girlfriend Paul Walker left an indelible mark behind after his car crash in 2013. Walker is best known for his role as Brian O'Connor in the Fast and Furious franchise. He appeared in five films in the series, starting with The Fast and the Furious in 2001. His portrayal of the character helped elevate the franchise to a global phenomenon, earning him a massive fan base. Beyond Fast and Furious, Walker showcased his versatility as an actor in various genres. He starred in films such as Joy Ride, 2001, Into the Blue, 2005, and Hours, 2013. His films collectively grossed over $5 billion worldwide, establishing him as a box office draw and one of the most recognizable faces in Hollywood. He was also charitable. In 2010, Walker founded Reach Out Worldwide, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing aid and assistance to communities affected by natural disasters. ROWW was active in various disaster stricken areas, including Haiti after the 2010 earthquake and the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan. He was also an avid car enthusiast and a skilled driver. However, one skeleton lingers on in the minds of many, even after. After his demise, Paul Walker was involved with a 16-year-old girl named Jasmine Pilchard Gosnell when he was in his late 30. Paul Walker was born on September 12, 1973, while Jasmine Pilchard Gosnell was born on September 18, 1989. This made Walker 33 years old when they began dating in 2006, while Jasmine was just 16, despite the age of consent in California being 18. The two reportedly met through a mutual friend, and their relationship relationship blossomed despite the scrutiny they faced due to their age difference. They were together until Paul's demise at the age of 40. Number 4. Travis Scott, Firing an Epileptic Manager Apparently, rapper and actor. Travis Scott left his ex-manager at a recording studio while he was having a seizure, and when he reached home, he texted him, firing him. Shane Morris, the ex-manager in question, claimed that Travis left him for dead while he was working for him in 2009. He later documented his story on Tumblr, stating, Late one night, we were all down in the dungeon, up late, having a party. Music was playing, we were all having fun. And then I did what all epileptic people do from time to time. I had a seizure, Morris continued. You know what Travis Scott did? He left. He and his friend Tony left me. I eventually ended up at the hospital that night, but Travis couldn't be bothered. Number 3. Mark Wahlberg, The Violent Racist in the early 1980s, Boston was a city divided by deep racial tensions. Wahlberg grew up in the working-class neighborhood of Dorchester, a place where poverty and crime were rampant. As a teenager, Wahlberg was part of a gang and quickly became embroiled in the city's undercurrent of racial animosity. The streets were his playground, but they were also the stage for a series of incidents that would haunt him for years to come. In 1986, when Wahlberg was just 15 years old, he and his friends began targeting 
targeting a group of African-American school children who were on a field trip. The boys hurled rocks at the children while shouting racial slurs. The school children were terrified, and the violence left a lasting impact on their lives. But for Wahlberg and his friends, it was just another day of asserting dominance through hate. In 1988, at the age of 16, he was involved in a far more serious incident, one that would later lead to his arrest and conviction. One night, Wahlberg and his friends were prowling the streets when they encountered a middle-aged Vietnamese man named Than Lam. Without provocation, Wahlberg attacked Lam, striking him in the head with a large wooden stick. As Lam lay unconscious, Wahlberg fled the scene, but his violent spree was not over. Later that same night, Wahlberg encountered another Vietnamese man, Hoa Trin. Once again, Wahlberg launched into a brutal attack, this time punching Trin in the eye. Throughout the assault, Wahlberg hurled racial slurs at his victim, adding a layer of hate-fueled intent to the violence. Wahlberg was quickly arrested and charged with attempted murder, but he ultimately pleaded guilty to felony assault. He was sentenced to two years in prison, though he served only 45 days. The brief sentence allowed him to avoid the full consequences of his actions, but the incidents left a stain on his record and a scar on the lives of his victims. Number 2. Will Smith, The Slap Will Smith has so many skeletons in his closet that he'd want you to forget. From the alleged rumors of him having intimate relations with male co-stars, to his wife's entanglement with singer August Alsina, to his parenting style that has produced quote-unquote weird children. However, these skeletons pale in comparison to the slap of March 27, 2022. It was a night of glitz and glamour, just like every other Oscars ceremony. The Dolby Theater in Los Angeles was alive with excitement as Hollywood's biggest stars gathered to celebrate the best films of the year. As the show progressed, the atmosphere was light and jovial. Chris Rock, one of the evening's hosts, was doing what he did best, making the audience laugh with his sharp, quick-witted jokes. Then came the moment that would change everything. Chris Rock glanced toward Will and Jada and made a joke about Jada's shaved head, referencing the movie G.I. Jane. The crowd chuckled, but Will's smile faltered moments after Jada looked visibly uncomfortable. Something inside Will snapped. A wave of emotion surged through him and without thinking, he stood up, his steps determined Determined as he made his way to the stage. The audience watched in confusion, unsure if this was part of the act. Then it happened. Will raised his hand and slapped Chris Rock across the face. The sound echoed through the theater, and for a moment, time seemed to freeze. The crowd gasped, and a shocked silence fell over the room. Chris Rock, stunned but trying to keep his composure, managed a nervous laugh, unsure of how to react. Will turned and walked back to his seat, his expression a mix of fury and and resolve. The cameras captured every moment as he sat down, his voice trembling with emotion as he shouted, Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth! The words hung in the air, raw and unfiltered. The aftermath was dreadful. Smith was not only banned from attending the Oscars or any Academy-related events for 10 years, but he was also condemned by his fans, who described the slap as an unacceptable act of violence, and his reputation carefully built over decades as a charming and likable star got a significant hit. Number 1. Keanu Reeves, His Troubled Past Keanu Reeves is hands down the nicest and kindest man in Hollywood, and he is not in this list for having done any bad things, but for having had a very troubled past. Did you know that his dad abandoned him at the age of three? He was born in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, and after his dad left him, he grew up with three different stepfathers. Her mother moved him around from Australia to New York to Toronto, which led to a destabilized life. He struggled in school, and his classmates bullied and laughed at him because of his dyslexia, a condition that made him change schools four times in five years. These schools included an acting school from which he was expelled for being a little too rambunctious. He never completed high school, dropping out before earning his diploma. He had a car accident, and no sooner had he recovered than his best friend River Phoenix died of a drug overdose outside a nightclub in Los Angeles. The loss hit Keanu hard, and he struggled to cope with the grief and guilt of losing someone so close to him. Just as Keanu was grappling with the loss of his friend, he faced another devastating blow. In 1999, he began a relationship with actress Jennifer Syme. The couple shared a deep connection, and their bond grew stronger over time. However, tragedy struck when Jennifer became pregnant. The couple was overjoyed at the prospect of becoming parents, 
but their happiness was short-lived. In December of the same year, Jennifer gave birth to a stillborn daughter, whom they named Ava. The loss shattered both of them, and the weight of grief became almost unbearable. In the aftermath of Ava's death, the couple struggled to cope with their pain. The once close relationship between Keanu and Jennifer began to fray under the strain of their heartache. Just a year later, in 2001, Jennifer died in a car accident, leaving Keanu to mourn the loss of his partner and the child they never had the chance to raise together. Click here to see 20